Thank you very much. A uh, quick background on the company. Uh, I was one of the founders of the company, and we started it in 2013. And it was founded by bringing two really interesting groups together. One group were machine learning experts, artificial intelligence people from the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. The other group were cyber security intelligence people from British intelligence, GCHQ, MI5. And in five short years, we've been able to grow to over 900 employees, 1.65 billion valuation, but most importantly, 2,500 customers, all different industries, all different countries around the world. In fact, we've now deployed in over 105 countries, including the Dominican Republic. So what, why do we keep reading about these cyber attacks? How come the attackers have been successful up until now? And why aren't the legacy approaches working? The reality is companies and governments have spent lots of money buying various security tools and technologies, but we're still hearing about these breaches. Well, there's a few reasons. One is the attacks have changed. They've changed in a few dimensions. One is that it's no longer the kind of casual hacker. These have become organized cyber crime rings coordinated around the world, and in some cases, working in tight partnership with even nation states. And they're now not just attacking governments, attacking other governments, there's still some of that, but now we've seen the battlefield shift inside of companies, and not just the big companies. Really, small companies, medium-sized companies, large companies, everyone is being affected, everyone is being targeted. And these attacks are starting to move very quickly. We saw signs of that with WannaCry, which spread around the world, but especially hit hard in Europe. Literally, you'd have the security team step up to get a cup of coffee and come back and have 80% of their company's infrastructure locked up. It just moved too quickly. But in addition to that, some of these attacks are very silent, very subtle. Think about an insider attack, right? That, that insider, that employee, that contractor, you've given them passwords, you've given them access to the systems, and they often know what they're after. But we still need to be able to catch those type of threats. And meanwhile, human teams are overwhelmed. There's three million open jobs in cybersecurity. There's not enough people to fill them. Basically, we have to have artificial intelligence to help these human teams out. Now, after painting a picture of somewhat doom and gloom, there's good news, and that is that we've been able to use artificial intelligence to create and emulate the human body's own immune system. We felt there needed to be a fundamentally different approach to solve this problem, and we looked to the human body for inspiration. Our human bodies have this immune system that understands an innate sense of self. So even when we're under attack by viruses and bacteria, our immune system has a very precise and very rapid response. That's exactly how dark trace works. That's how our artificial intelligence works to catch these threats inside of companies. But in addition to using machine learning to do anomaly detection, and understand how to detect threats, that's just half the equation. It's one thing to find the threat, but how can we rely on the artificial intelligence to stop the threats? And that's one of the things that makes us and our approach very unique. We've actually gotten to the point now where we have the artificial intelligence not only finding the threat, but investigating it, making recommendations about what to do about the threat, in even taking action. Action like slowing down the attack. What if the attack happens at 3 a.m. and you don't have 24 by 7 coverage? 
well, what if the AI could just put the attack on pause until the security team gets into the office to deal with it? Or what if it's one of those machine speed, fast moving attacks? What if the AI could just stop the attack, but not just stop it in the traditional sense? I mean, we've had things like IDS and IPS systems before, but people stopped using them because it was disrupting business, right? It was taking the computers offline when there was an attack. But one of the things that we found was really unique is you can use artificial intelligence to understand the pattern of life, the behavior of every person and every device connected to that organization's network or cloud. So once you know what's normal behavior, once you know this pattern of life at a very granular level, what that means you can do is when your company or government institution is under attack, you can actually enforce normal. So rather than take all the systems offline and clean up the malware, why not just enforce normal? Make the computer systems do what they do every day. Let people access their email. Let customers place orders. And then just isolate this unusualness of the attack while you can clean it up in the background. What that means is there's no data stolen, there's no business outages, no disruption of operations. It means even though the attacks aren't going to go away, in fact, they're probably going to get worse in the future, it means that we could sustain normal operations by using these AI techniques. And that changes the whole mindset of how we defend against cyber attacks. And now, it's one thing to talk about this in theory, but let's talk about some, some of these types of attacks that we've caught in the real world. And I'd like to walk through it so you can really figure out how the AI works. The first one is, Darktrace was deployed at a casino. And I always thought, okay, in a casino, maybe they're gonna be after the, the slot machines <clears throat> or the, the money itself. But in this particular case, the attacker was smarter than that. What they wanted was access to the names and information of the high rollers. It turns out in a casino, having that high roller database is really worth a lot of money, especially if you work for another casino and you want to steal your competitor's high rollers. So what the attacker did is they scanned the network and this is getting more and more common. The attackers scan for unprotected Internet of Things or IoT devices. Why? A lot of them aren't protected. There's not agents running on them. They, people forget to tell the IT and the security team that they're connecting these devices up because they don't think about them as a security risk. So this attacker scans the network and they find an Internet connected thermostat in this big shark tank in the lobby of the casino. They use that as a way to get access into the casino's network. They start what's called lateral movement across the network, looking for the high roller database. They find a, the high roller database, they move it back across the network, and they're going to try to exfiltrate it out through this thermostat. They've set up a private cloud in Finland to move the data. I don't know why Finland, but that's where the private cloud was set up. Okay, so why did this go miss? This casino had lots of security tools in place. Well, first is, most security tools are rules-based. Someone would have to think to write a rule that says the fish tank can't access the high roller database. No one thought to write that rule. How would you think to write that rule? But the attackers are very creative. The artificial intelligence was able to find it. The first way it found it is that thermostat had never scanned the, in the network before inside the casino. So it caught it right away. It was doing an unusual network scan. The second thing is the fish tank had never accessed that database. The third thing is the fish tank had never moved a large amount of data across the network. And finally, no one in that casino had ever connected to this remote new server in Finland. The AI was able to spot it four different times and stop it before 
the High Roller database went missing. Another thing we've seen is Bitcoin mining. Now, even though Bitcoin values go up and down, so it somewhat changes, in over half our customers, we've seen unusual Bitcoin mining operations in their company network. But this one was quite extreme. This was inside a bank. The bank had a very secure data center. There was an employee in the data center, and his job was to accept new servers, prepare them and rack mount them in the data center. And if you've been in a bank, literally there's tens of thousands of servers. So what he was doing is every once in a while, he would take a server and instead of rack mount it in the data center, he set up his own, his own Bitcoin mining operation underneath the floorboards in the data center. He did this over a sustained period of time. And this pre-existed before Darktrace was installed. So we install the artificial intelligence. And we see, keep seeing this, these servers near the data center beaconing to some rare destination that ended up being the external Bitcoin site. Because unless you can access the Bitcoin site, you can't produce value. So we, we highlighted this to the bank. And they kept saying, this, this isn't true. This must be an AI false positive. We said, well, actually, we only analyze your, your data, your traffic. So there's nothing false about it. So finally, we asked if they would let one of our employees into their secure data center. And one of our very clever um, software developers created a geospatial location system so he could bring that into the data center. And he was able to identify where the beaconing was coming from. And we traced it to under the floorboards in the data center. Now, these might seem like strange examples. These are both real examples. But by the way, we find hundreds, if not thousands, of these examples every week. In fact, if you're interested in these type of things, if you go to the Darktrace website, we have a blog. And every week, we post these type of attacks that we have found using artificial intelligence. So what, what makes this special? How do you get this technology adopted? I think there's three key things that we've learned along the way. One is the AI has to work. It's one thing to get it working in a lab, in an academic setting. You have to make it work in a practical way and in a commercial way. So for example, we use something called unsupervised machine learning. It's been in academia for quite some time. It's very hard to get working in the real world. Why? It can take too long. So initially, when we developed this, it was taking us, let's say, three to six months to understand and map a whole company. We now can install this in less than one hour. We let the machine learning work for five to seven business days. And it's smart enough after that time to find threats. Within 30 days, it knows over 90 to 95% of what it's going to need to know about that company. But it's self-learning. It stays up with new people, new devices, business changes. So it's really important that the AI works in the real world, where real people, real devices, in real time. Those are the key things to making things work. And you have to make it so that people don't have to hire their own AI or machine learning people. These people are hard to find. There's not many of them. So you need to make it work independently on its own. The next thing is access to data. It's really important that you get the access to the information you need. Now, what was interesting in security is we're not the only ones saying you were using it machine learning or AI. Now, unfortunately, a lot of those companies really don't have real machine learning or AI. But even those that do, I think many of them pointed it at the wrong training data set. Our training data set is network traffic, cloud traffic, email, everything that's connecting, everything that has an IP to, uh, address. We pull out 400 data features. It's a rich amount of information. Other companies use historical attack data as their training data set. Well, guess what? Yesterday's attack has nothing to do with tomorrow's attack. That's why this industry has been failing of working. It assumes historical attacks were a predictor of future attacks. It's a flawed assumption. 
So making sure you get your training data set right is so critical. Finally, trust. You have to have trust of the artificial intelligence or people will not use it. So I had our data scientists and machine learning experts say, it works, and we could prove it worked. But people said, I, I don't want to use a black box. I need to see and understand what's going on. We built a 3D visualizer, so now people can see the inside of their networks and cloud like they never could before. We built a mobile application so people could constantly see what alerts it was finding, what recommendations it was making. We created artificial intelligence-generated reporting so people could report to their C-level executives and their board of directors and tell them exactly what was happening, what trends they were seeing. So don't underestimate the importance of building that trust. Now, everything I've talked about so far, there was a human's hands on a keyboard of those attacks. Fish tank, Bitcoin mining in the bank, there were human hands on those keyboards, but the world is changing. I'm talking about using artificial intelligence to defend against attacks, but what about when the attackers use AI? There's two new emerging areas to pay attention to. One is called offensive AI, and that's when the attackers all of a sudden get their hands on AI toolkits to use as part of the attacks. There's also an area called adversarial AI, we know there is concern about the impact AI is going to have on humanity. And there's going to be activists combined with hackers, so hacktivists, who basically attack AI systems. Why? They're going to want people and society to lose trust in AI. So these two areas are new emerging areas of attack, offensive and adversarial AI, that we have to all start being prepared for. This is an analyst firm, Forrester, and they're predicting that when cyber attackers start employing this AI, it's going to mean the attacks are going to be even more fast moving, harder to find. We're going to have to have self-defending AI systems to protect our companies against this. So we've created a new offensive AI research and development center in Cambridge. We have 35 PhDs and mathematicians in deep learning. We've set up, for example, something called GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks. So you basically take two AI systems, and one of them tries to create brand new attacks. The other one tries to detect and defend against them. This is what we think the future of cyber attacks are going to be. It's going to be an outright war of algorithm against algorithm. Whose math is better? So who does do it better? We, out of some of that research in our labs, spent five years using machine learning to learn from human threat analysts. Not only what threats they found interesting, how to investigate them, what to do about them. Recently, we got it to the point, and we hire, we've hired over 100 analysts. A lot of them came from NSA, CIA, GCHQ, MI5, so some of the best threat analysts in the world. Our cyber AI analyst is now beating the best analysts in the world 44% of the time. 40% of the time, it's indiscernible which was better, and only 16% of the time are these world-class threat analysts outperforming the AI. That's what this is going to take. We're going to need to have augmentation of our security teams. We're going to have to have cyber AI analysts that can do this quick machine against machine defense. And this is where we predict the world of cyber defense is going. But I will leave you with the thought that you need to get started with it. You need to start training people in your IT and your security organization to work with artificial intelligence. You need to allow time for this trust to build between the humans and the systems. You need to build in features like what we call recommendation mode, human confirmation mode, so that people still maintain control and trust before they put it in active mode. 
Thank you very much.